Okay, so I think we'll get started. It's two after. I'm sure that people will start, uh, will continue to trickle in. Um, I uh, am sharing a portion of my screen now as opposed to being presenter mode. So I apologize if you see little uh, squigglies under words or something to that effect um, through the presentation. Um, tech savviness is not my uh, strong suit. But anyway, so I'm Sydney. I'm one of the um, PGY3s in the Royal College program. And my supervisor for this talk was Dr. Robotham. And today's presentation will be on um, Parkinson's disease in the emergency department. So it would help if I could actually change slides. There we go. And I just want to give a, a special thanks to uh, Dr. Alfonso Fasano, who's one of the neurologists in Toronto and uh, specializes in uh, Parkinson's disease. He's actually online today to listen in, um, as well as uh, Dr. Sunil uh, Kalia, who's one of the neurosurgeons in Toronto as well, both of which were instrumental in answering a bunch of my questions around this topic. So thanks to them both. And I have no disclosures. So just to go over the objectives for the talk. So the first is just going to be understanding the basic pathophysiology of Parkinson's, um, going through some of their common treatment options and the side effects associated, as well as things that we can potentially do to these patients that make things worse. Um, and just <clears throat> pardon me, introduce some uh, zebras to be um, aware of in the Parkinson's population. The second half of the presentation is um, about deep brain stimulation and uh, levodopa carbidopa intestinal gel pumps in uh, Parkinson's disease. So before we get started, I just wanted to present a couple of cases. Um, these are all made up, but just to kind of think to yourself how you might approach these patients currently, and then we'll revisit them at the end and see if uh, your thoughts to them have changed at all. So the first is just a 71-year-old um, male comes in initially CTAS-3, escalated to CTAS-1, um, was initially brought in because of some paranoia uh, and uh, um, concerns from the wife and the neighbors. And initially, is cooperative in the weight room, but then starts to get agitated, um, starts yelling um, at other patients, and security and a doc is called for overhead. Um, and those are his triage vitals. Case two is a 67 year old man, CTAS 4, waiting in the emerge uh, weight room for about six hours. Uh, presenting complaint was feels that his Parkinson's symptoms are worsening, some slight nausea, one time of emesis this morning, uh, some worsening shoulder pain, tried some Tylenol, didn't really work. And those are his uh, triage vitals. And then the case three is the exact same as case two. The only difference is that this patient had uh, DBS inserted three years prior, so deep brain stimulation. And then case four is a 70-year-old man, CTAS-1. Uh, son found him on the kitchen floor at home, last chatted with him three days ago. And in the emerges, confused, uh, only two words, slow responses, rigid extremities, uh, mild tremor. Um, and those are his triage vitals there. So... Um, going into the uh, epidemiology a bit, so Parkinson's is the second most common uh, neurodegenerative disease um, after Alzheimer's. It is uh, on the rise um, as far as prevalence goes. So there's about um, 100,000 Canadians who are estimated to have uh, Parkinson's. And out of a UK study in 2018, there's projected to be about a 30% increase in the prevalence by 2030. The graph there, I apologize if it's hard to see, is just Canadian data about uh, the prevalence of those living with Parkinson's uh, since about 2004. And the vast majority of these cases are, are not inherited, um, and the average age of onset is about 60 years old. However, there is about 5 to 10 percent of people who do have symptoms starting at um, less than 50 years old. And so... Parkinson's is uh, a bit of a uh, complicated disease and more so than I initially appreciated before um, trying to study into it a bit further. Um, it 
obviously does affect your um, dopaminergic innervation into uh, your substantia nigra, but it does affect other neural pathways as well and does involve other neurotransmitter systems um, and not just the dopaminergic uh, um, neurotransmitters. So things like your cholinergic, serotonergic, and noradrenergic symptom, uh, systems are involved as well, um, which leads it to be a more heterogeneous disorder as well as um, provide some non-motor uh, symptoms that I, again, I wasn't aware of prior to looking into it a bit further, but does make it a little bit more complex than uh, initially meets the eye. Typically, um, as far as diagnosis goes, the only way to truly diagnose um, Parkinson's is by uh, histopathology on autopsy looking for Lewy bodies. Obviously, that's not how we want to do that in uh, everyday patients, but um, that means that we are uh, going off of a clinical approach to the diagnosis. And typically what it is, is a gradual progression over time with a triad of three kind of main motor symptoms. Uh, tremor being like your pill rolling, tremor in your hands, your um, tremor in arms and legs, and even the head a bit as well, as well as bradykinesias and truncal and limb rigidity. Some people will also throw postural instability in there as well, but typically that's a more um, late finding of the disease rather than present at uh, initial diagnosis. So other than those uh, three kind of triads, there are a couple other motor symptoms um, that can be found in Parkinson's, so being your uh, dysphagia or speech issues, but there are also a handful of non-motor symptoms that are quite prevalent as well, so being behavioral or cognitive impairment, um, issues with um, GI motility, issues with sleep, um, mood, and Parkinson's associated pain is actually quite a, uh, a big problem. They uh, are a lot more sensitive to pain, but also they have uh, these fluctuations between uh, dystonia and dyskinesias, which also kind of heighten their perception of pain as well. On one study, 98% of people uh, with Parkinson's reported an average of eight non-motor symptoms, so not unsubstantial. And understandably, the more common and more bothersome uh, non-motor symptoms were pain, mood, and sleep problems. Within mood, um, psychosis is not uncommon either, especially with patients who are on drug therapy. Mostly it is visual hallucinations, but can manifest in other ways as well. And it's thought to be kind of an interaction of the partially Lewy body disease, as well as the medication that they get put on. Um, and paranoid delusions can also be a uh, part of the disease as well. Again, typically more so with um, certain medications. With that, I just wanted to touch on some of the drugs that are used to treat the non-motor uh, symptoms in these patients. And the asterisk is just there because these medications are not the only ones that are used for each of these different uh, presenting or these complaints, um, but just some of the medications that I wanted everyone to be aware of because they have uh, potential side effects and other complications. Um, so for example, you could end up with a serotonin syndrome because you're on multiple serotonergic medications, your SSRIs, um, et cetera. And then these patients are also potentially on uh, TCAs for sleep or anxiety. Um, they also are, can potentially be on atropine drops for drooling, so being aware of your anticholinergic side effects. Um, Dumperidone can also uh, prolong your QT, um, and then clozapine for visual hallucinations, which as we know is more of a concern with agranulocytosis, um, and then fludrocortisone for orthostatic hypotension, which is also a big problem in these patients, and that can cause some hypokalemia. Moving on to the motor targeted treatments. So there's two kind of main ways of attacking uh, this problem. There are a couple of other medications that are used as well, but which I will touch on, but the two main are your dopamine agonists, which effectively mean that your um, dopaminergic um, neurons are forced to work harder and try to produce more dopamine versus your dopamine replacement, which is just giving it back and kind of um, not having to worry about the neurons producing their own dopamine. 
So your dopamine agonists are things like your repinerol, retigotine, and premopexil. The pros behind this class of medication is just that it produces less dyskinesias than your levodopa does, but it does cause more non-motor uh, side effects. So your hallucination, confusion, et cetera, as well as some um, daytime sleepiness. The uh, another interesting piece of this is it does tend to um, worsen or cause impulse control disorders as well. So if someone is started on this medication, they typically have to watch out for any um, impulsive behaviors or increase in that. Uh, that may actually be a side effect of the medication. And then the other thing that's of interest for the dopamine agonist is their specific withdrawal syndrome. So if someone decides to stop taking it for a couple of days for whatever reason, um, and they end up in withdrawal, so anxiety, panic attacks, um, diaphoresis, et cetera, then even if you were to try to treat them with levodopa, they may not actually um, respond to that. They may actually require uh, replacement or resuming of their dopamine agonist to get out of that withdrawal syndrome. So moving on to dopamine replacement, which is what most of us are familiar with, which is your uh, carbidopa, levodopa, aka cinnamon. And the pros with this is that it has a better motor response to um, uh, treating symptoms and has less non-motor side effects. The problem is, is that uh, it does have the potential or does produce more dyskinesias, especially with uh, higher and more frequent dosing. And as the disease progresses, um, it's about 10% uh, per year of patients will end up starting have or will have motor complications. So by 10 years, like 100% of patients will have some sort of motor complications. And this typically means that you also have to increase your dosing of um, levodopa as well and frequency of dosing to try to kind of stay on top of those symptoms. The other thing with it is it does have a dietary protein interaction. So it can't really be taken with protein or else it will impair the um, absorp absorption and utilization of the um, levodopa. And it will be from now on just referring to cinema and carbidopa levodopa just as levodopa for simplicity's sake. Um, so typically it's supposed to be taken on an empty stomach or like just with a bit of carbs. Um, the other thing with levodopa is that it does uh, have some, uh, can cause nausea and vomiting as well as uh, lower blood pressures. The carbidopa piece in it is a uh, peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor, which essentially prevents the conversion of levodopa to dopamine until it can cross the blood brain barrier to try to prevent some of those side effects. Obviously it's not perfect, but it does help. And then just briefly, the other um, motor medications that can be used in these uh, patients is your MAO uh, B inhibitors. So again, being aware of your serotonin syndrome, um, uh, if you're kind of adding on serotonergic medications in these patients, but the MAOB inhibitors do slow the metabolism of dopamine. Um, your anticholinergics, uh, again, more so in younger patients do decrease tremor and muscle rigidity. Uh, and then lastly, it's just your NMDA antagonists, such as amantadine, which decreases tremor and involuntary movement. So uh, a bunch of different medications that uh, these patients patients can be on to try to improve their both motor and non-motor symptoms. So moving on to the iatrogenic complications. So if you have someone who's coming in um, nauseous, you're going to really want to avoid Maxran in this uh, patient population because it is a dopamine receptor blocker. You'll just end up aggravating their Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, ideally, you'd be using Ondansetron instead. And then similarly, in your psychotic patient, you're going to want to avoid Haldol because it also blocks dopamine receptors. And interestingly, the only antipsychotics that are really um, kind of suggested in this patient population are Seroquel and Clozapine. Obviously you can use benzos, but that comes also with the risks of just using benzos in an older patient population as well. Um, and then patients uh, in pain, especially those who are on MAOIs and SSRIs, um, avoiding things like tramadol. I know we uh, don't love tramadol here anyway, but uh, just uh, another reason not to love it. Um, there was a study that did look at Parkinson's patients who had um, who were on both an MAOI and an SSRI to see if there was an increased rate of serotonin syndrome just within that um, patient population. They didn't see an increased rate, but they did see uh, an increase in uh, um, serotonin syndrome when another serotonergic medication was added uh, in addition to those two. 
So ideally in these patients, you're going to be using Tylenol plus or minus morphine if it's uh, an acute like arm break or something to that effect, um, plus or minus levodopa and the levodopa piece I will touch on in a bit as well. So the hypertensive patient can also pose a bit of uh, a tricky uh, situation as well because Parkinson's does come with significant dysautonomia and orthostatic hypotension. Um, you can essentially with levodopa, um, if the patient is off their meds, they can have uh, systolics up into the 200s range. And then when their levodopa kicks in, they can actually drop into the 80s. So um, for example, if you had someone in the eMERGE who was lying down and in an off state, which I will define in just a second, um, essentially meaning that their um, symptoms are, their PD symptoms are coming back, their blood pressure may read 200 over 100, but then when you give the patient their levodopa 30 minutes later, they start to feel better and you try to walk test them and they stand up and they faint. Um, so just to be mindful of that as well. So briefly, just some terminology. So on time with uh, Parkinson's refers to um, just the effect positive effects that levodopa will have on Parkinson's uh, symptoms and off state or off episode will uh, refer to the re-emergence of Parkinson's symptoms, both non-motor and motor as the levodopa wears off. So I had a handful of questions and these are a couple of the ones that I uh, initially came to uh, Dr. Uh, Pisano and uh, Dr. Kalia with as well. Um, and these are the answers. So the I have a patient in the eMERGE that's been waiting forever in the wait room. Do I need to get them their levodopa ASAP? What's kind of the timeline for that? And the answer is with pretty much everything in medicine is it depends. Um, and it really depends on where the patient is in their um, trajectory of Parkinson's. So if, for example, they were newly diagnosed, only had it for a year or two, their levodopa requirements probably aren't very high and they may actually be able to go about 24 hours without um, their medication with only mild uh, um, side effects from that. However, those who have had Parkinson's for 10 or 15 years who are taking their levodopa uh, five to seven times a day really can't go that long and should try to um, have their um, dosing as, as close to as, as reasonably possible their normal times. That being said, um, a lot of patients won't skip their medication because they feel crappy without their meds. So it's not um, usually a voluntary uh, thing. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is when you are giving levodopa back to these patients is it will take about 30 minutes to kick in. So it's not an, an instantaneous thing um, and ideally given on an empty stomach. So with re-emergence of some of the Parkinson's symptoms, it, you can have issues with the trouble swallowing and stuff again. So if you have a patient that has trouble swallowing, how do I get them their levodopa? And the, the answer is, is that it can easily be crushed and given through the NG um, if you are concerned about uh, um, swallowing and aspiration risk. And then, so I think that my patient may be having an off episode. How do I treat them? And the easiest way is just going to be giving them levodopa, whether it's PO or through an NG and just starting at their normal dose. Um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, just that should be enough until you can consult with the neurology to figure out where to go from there. Um, it is a, a, just a tablet that we can easily get from pharmacy from um, same as any other medication that we would order. Whereas apomorphine is a, so it is a highly potent dopamine agonist and it's a, a subcutaneous medication. We can get it at UH. Um, I, for sure, I'm not sure about Vic, um, but it's a non-formulary medication. So it takes some time to make up and is usually only good for about 48 hours is my understanding um, afterwards. So not as easily, <clears throat> pardon me, not as easily acceptable or readily ac accessible, but uh, levodopa would definitely be an easy go-to. And so what is the best option for pain management in these patients then? So. Parkinson's can make their body more sensitive to a variety of different things, whether it's a virus or even just what they're eating because of um, differences in carb or protein load. And the biggest thing you want to ask is, um, 
the patient is in your off states or when your uh, levodopa is wearing off, is this the same kind of pain that you get? Like, is this your Parkinson's associated pain versus something that's new and not related? And if it is, then likely levodopa is going to be your best alternative to try to treat that pain rather than your typical analgesics. But if that is the case, then you're going to want to ask yourself, why is this happening? So why are they having um, worsening of their um, Parkinson's symptoms? So is it that um, they're currently living in a pandemic and haven't been able to see their specialist to have their dose increase as appropriate and this is just disease progression? Or is this a trigger of some underlying other issues such as an infection, et cetera? So for just as an example, as, as simple as it may be, is just that a person may have had a high protein uh, dinner the night before, they've got a little bit of constipation going on, which then also worsened their gastric emptying, their levodopa pills are just sitting in their stomach, um, and they're starting to kind of get into more of a, an off state. And uh, Dr. Christina suggested that you can even just try crushing the levodopa, mixing it with carbonated water, and that may help with bypassing the stomach faster to get uh, it quicker symptom improvement. On to the zebras. So the first is uh, Parkinsonism hyperpyrexia syndrome, which is an NMS thing like this. Oh, is someone trying to say something? No, okay. Um, it's an NMS-like syndrome that has an incidence of about 0.3%, but a mortality of about 4%. Um, and a lot of these do require ICU uh, admission and care. It was first um, characterized in patients with Parkinson's who were uh, taking drug holidays back in the day because they felt like that was the, um, an optimal way to um, prevent their eventual increased need of levodopa, but they ended up in uh, this situation, which is obviously not ideal. Um, what ends up happening is they get that uh, um, hyperthermia, dysautonomia, confusion, um, et cetera, but they also get uh, hypersalivation and dysphagia. And so those two in combination with their akinesis will be what really helps you differentiate this from like a serotonin syndrome uh, type situation. Um, and triggers for this typically are more your a withdrawal of dopaminergic meds, but can also be as simple as just underlying infections or trauma. Um, and the treatment is going to be your levodopa via NG or your apomorphine if you do have access to it uh, to get them out of that akinetic crisis but also um, propofol to stop that uh, like dystonic storm. And then obviously your cooling IV fluid supportive measures and uh, prophylactic anticoagulants. And as far as an approach to um, NG levodopa, you would mix um, 1,000 milligrams of crushed levodopa with a liter of water and a gram of uh, vitamin C, plus or minus domperidone if you're having delayed gastric emptying concerns, and that's what you would um, instill through the NG tube in this situation. The second zebra is arguably less common um, even than the other rare zebra, which is your dyskinesia hyperpyrexia syndrome, which is effectively the opposite end of the spectrum in that it's more of a dyskinetic storm, a ton of movement causing this hyperthermia um, altered mental status picture. Um, this is more, there are a number of case reports on this, but it's not nearly as well documented uh, or as common as the um, Parkinsonism hyperpyrexia syndrome. And triggers are, again, more increased in your dopaminergic meds, but can also be trauma. And even in some of the case reports, they really didn't find an obvious trigger for it. Um, and the treatment is going to be effectively the same, but just instead of adding levodopa, you're going to be stopping their dopaminergic meds, giving propofol to um, stop that uh, um, dyskinetic storm, and then just cooling and uh, supportive measures. So... Part two is moving on to more of our high-tech Parkinson's patients. So those who have um, uh, deep brain stimulation devices or levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal gel pumps, um, 
technically apomorphine subcutaneous infusion pumps are a thing, although they aren't really available in Canada. It's more of a US thing right now. So I'm not gonna to touch on those, but I'm just going to um, talk about the, the first two. So with uh, deep brain stimulation, it's typically for younger patients whose motor symptoms are having, um, aren't adequately controlled with their levodopa. Um, and in these patients, it's typically the, the tremor that responds best to the DBS treatment um, among other motor complications, but uh, the tremor is definitely the most improvement, um, about a 50% reduction. This means that they are able to have about a 50% reduction in their daily levodopa dose. So this doesn't mean that these patients will not be on any medications. They will still require some form of Parkinson medication, um, but just at a significantly reduced dose, which means that they also have less side effects related to that medication. So a, a big bonus in that respect. As far as the, um, how the, uh, uh, deep uh, brain stimulation works. Essentially, you have the, a small little hole uh, drilled into your skull. You have the electrode inserted into a specific part of the brain. Typically with Parkinson's, it's into the subthalamic nuclei. And then you have these extension wires that connect the leads to the um, neurostimulator uh, or an implantable um, um, pulse generator slash IPG. In London, we have about 20 patients per year who end up having this surgery. And uh, as an example, over the 2015, 2016 year period, there were 347 of these surgeries in Ontario and half of Canada's cases are in Toronto. So not unreasonable that we potentially could see uh, one of these patients in the emergency department. So how does the surgery work? Kind of what's the um, timeline around it? And kind of how does, it, how does this work? Um, depending on the center, the, there are two stages to the, the surgery, but depending on the center, you will either have both stages done in the same admission as they do in Toronto, or some places will bring the patient in for one stage, send them home, and then bring them back into the hospital for the second stage. Stage one being your electrode insertion. And if you are going home, it's usually a one or two day hospital stay. And then stage two is the IPG insertion. And again, kind of a one day stay. What's important to keep in mind uh, in the immediate kind of post-op period is that for about six to eight weeks post-implantation, the DBS device will not be turned on. Um, and this is to avoid the honeymoon period. So it, when they go um, sticking electrodes into the brain and stuff, it for whatever reason, causes um, an improvement in the patient's symptoms for about the four to, or six to eight week period. So if they were to turn the DBS device on right away, then they would risk under-programming the device. So if a person comes into the eMERGE in that kind of two month period post-op, that device is not going to be on. So just keep that in mind. And then in the subsequent weeks after it gets turned on, they'll come in on a weekly basis to slowly start to decrease their levodopa dosing and increase the DBS uh, stimulation settings. So the things that the neurosurgeons ask um, patients to be aware of and potentially come into the emergency department for are kind of what you would expect your infection, seizure, stroke concerns, but also for changes in thinking or changes in mood. Um, there is in the literature some um, kind of speculation and concern that after DBS insertion, some people have uh, significant suicidal ideation or behaviors, although talking to Dr. Kalia, it doesn't sound like that's actually borne out um, in real life or um, even really in the, in the literature. So the, more, the bigger concern would be with your impulse control disorders post DBS insertion from your mood perspective. <clears throat> So briefly about the technology used here. So there are three companies um, for which the um, produce DBS devices in Canada. Um, so we have Medtronics, Boston Scientific and Abbott. Um, I am going to be showing pictures of Boston Scientific devices and only because they were the easiest that I could find pictures of. There's no other reason. As I said, I don't have any disclosures. Um, the battery life for these IPGs will depend on whether it's um, a rechargeable or non-rechargeable device. So if it's non-rechargeable, it'll be about two to four years. If it's rechargeable, it'll be about 25 years. 
and every patient will have a DBS registration card um, that will have their rep contact information on it. So if you do have a question about the device or how to work it or how it's functioning, you can always call that number. The patient also will have a remote control that allows them to uh, control their DBS device. So it's effectively like a DBS programmer. It allows them to turn it on or off as well as change modes um, that allow them to do different things. So whether it's walking or better for walking, better for tremor, et cetera. So what would be your approach to um, a patient in the eMERGE with DBS? Uh, first things first is just, it's not likely going to be a cause, uh, whatever they're coming in with for their decrease or, or increase in Parkinson's symptoms, it's not likely going to be the DBS as a source. We really need to consider all other causes first, the more kind of um, more likely to be a UTI, some other underlying infection that's just caused them to be a bit off homeostasis and therefore having a worsening of their symptoms. It could also be disease progression, as I said, living in a pandemic and afraid to go in to get uh, their um, stimulation changed as needed. And that's actually more so what's happening rather than a, a true malfunction in the device. So as a rule of thumb, your DBS as a source is going to be your diagnosis of exclusion. So don't uh, focus in on that, at least at first. And the other thing to note is, is it sounds like in Toronto, there's maybe one time per year that um, they need to come in in the middle of the night to change someone's battery. So from that perspective, again, not very common or happen very often. But you still think it's the device in this particular patient. So the, the first thing to kind of consider is, is it one side or both sides that's malfunctioning? And the reason that's important is if, say, you have a lead fracture on the one side and the one side isn't functioning, so they're having worsening of their Parkinson's from that perspective, but the other side is, and if you supplement with levodopa, then you're going to get increased um, uh, dyskinesias on that side because you're hyper-supplementing the, uh, the working side. Um, but as far as the actual common chronic issues, the most common is going to be your battery depletion, then followed by hardware malfunction, and then uh, lastly would be your infection. So battery issues, kind of an approach to that would just be, A, is the battery turned on? Um, is it low or is it just plain dead? And so this is a picture of uh, Boston Scientific's uh, remote control here and the big red button in the center there is your stimulator on or off button. Um, it's not unreasonable to think that say a patient accidentally turned it off by mistake and just didn't think to check. So first things first, just check and make sure it's on. Um, if it is on, then you'll start to look for whether this is like a, a low battery issue. So on your um, non-rechargeable stimulators, the uh, remote control will only show one battery icon, and that's actually for the remote. Um, it obviously won't be for the IPG. If it is a rechargeable uh, stimulator, then you will have the two battery icons, one for the remote and one for the actual stimulator itself. Um, and as far as the actual low battery piece of it, for your non-rechargeable devices, you will get this kind of like low gas light equivalent symbol that comes up here, which you can see on the left, which says, okay, 180 days uh, of service remaining. Um, that being said, in these situations, typically the battery will still be putting out the same amount of stimulation as it has previously for say, um, 140 of those 180 days and it's only in the last 40 days that the actual amount of stimulation is provided will start to decrease. So just keep that in mind that even if you do see a um, like a, a low low battery low gas light or low battery kind of symbol, then it's still likely probably providing the same amount of stimulation and whatever is happening is not necessarily related to that and may just mislead you down that direction. And then for the rechargeable um, stimulators, you'll have again both the stimulator battery low symbol as well as um, the like charge it now. Um, this needs to be dealt with right now. How it's recharged is only like 20 minutes uh, transdermally three times a week. So it's not a, a huge amount of uh, time to be able to get it back up and running, but um, they do need the transdermal uh, recharge charger. So now you're concerned more it's a, a dead battery situation based on what you're seeing on their remote. So 
Um, for the non-rechargeable IPGs, you have on the left there your ERI um, notification, which is emergency or emergent replacement indicator, which tells the patient they need to get in contact with their neurosurgeon like now to be able to uh, facilitate a urgent replacement of their battery. Um, the EOS or end of service is meanings that means that the battery is actually dead. Like it is not providing stimulation um, and it's at the end of its life. However, if the battery is like dead, dead and properly fully dead, you won't actually see anything on the um, remote control. It won't even tell you EOS. And then for your rechargeable devices, all it'll say is the stimulator service exceeded and just kind of have that big red uh, circle with the cross through it saying that it's, it's not providing stimulation any longer. So troubleshooting this a little bit further in the eMERGE. So someone stole my remote or, I mean, really most likely is just they left it at home or whatever, and you want to make sure that their DBS is actually working. You can put an ECG electrode nearby and actually see if there's artifact present on the ECG tracing, and that will tell you that the DBS is in fact turned on. Sometimes patients will uh, get a new group or a new um, mode uh, programmed into their device, as I said before, kind of to help them either specifically with walking or um, more of a nighttime mode, and they forget how to change it and they'll panic and come into the eMERGE. Um, in that situation, all you really need to do is call the rep. Um, they'll be able to kind of walk you through how to actually change the modes and show the patient how to do it and they can go on their merry way. So as alluded to, you want an ECG on this patient because you're concerned they are having a, a cardiac event or something to that effect. And this is the ECG you get, which is obviously not super helpful. Um, so there's a, a ton of interference with the uh, neurostimulator. Uh, Per Dr. Fasano, sometimes also you can see um, what looks like more of an atrial flutter as well as the artifact. So realistically, in order to be able to get uh, an accurate proper ECG, you're going to need to turn the device off. Putting a magnet over it won't interrupt it, won't stop it. You actually need to temporarily stop the DBS device. So DBS equals ECG artifacts. Um, it is not risky to not turn off the device for a short period of time, but do keep in mind that the tremor also causes artifacts. So you really need to be ready to get that ECG as soon as you turn the stimulator off um, before the tremor reemerges. It's going to be the first thing to reemerge. Typically your dystonia and your rigidity only start to reemerge after about 24 hours or so. Um, so not as much of a concern. And so you go to turn off the device and the patient reports that they feel something funny that they haven't really felt before, or you go to turn it back on and they feel this pulling or jumping sensation that usually resolves in seconds. All of this is not uncommon and is to be kind of expected in a sense and is not something to be concerned about. Um, it is kind of an expected side effect of turning the device on or off. Looking at hardware malfunctions, so this can be something as far as electrode migration within the brain, either a lead break anywhere along the path. You can kind of see that in the, the picture there, just uh, around uh, the um, um, connection at the bottom. And then as well, similar to like your pacemakers, you can also get like a Twiddler syndrome situation. Your approach to this is, uh, especially if you think it's like a lead fracture is going to be getting x-rays, you're going to need to get both uh, like essentially entirely from the top of your head to uh, your abdomen to be able to fully assess uh, in continuity those leads. And the other thing to keep in mind as well is you may not actually be able to appreciate the lead fracture unless you get the patient to turn their head um, side to side, like turn side, take a picture, turn side, take the x-ray. Um, and that will actually allow the leads to pull apart enough to see the break. Um, even still, even with that, you may not see it. They can be super subtle, but that at least would be your first approach to that. Um, and again, with the electrode migration would be more of um, a CT thing that you would have to evaluate. Moving on to the infection, obviously this can either occur in the IPG or along the um, uh, 
lead that travels under the skin, um, which would be a little bit more obvious, or if the patient's starting to have uh, other weird deficits um, or uh, feet and fevers and stuff like that, then you'd be more concerned about like a weird collection around the actual electrode itself, in which case, um, oh, that's weird. Okay, in which case, um, the CT would be most appropriate for that. I just got a pop-up that said participants can now see my screen. Is, uh, Roy, have you been able to not see my screen this entire time? No, it's been up the whole time. I'm seeing the presentation. Okay, perfect. I just random pop-up then. Okay. Ultimately, uh, in these patients, you're going to need to call for help. Um, whether that means calling uh, neurology if you're at a DBS center or uh, calling to your kind of closest DBS center. Uh, sometimes if it's something that's a little bit more minor, you can just call the tech support line. And then depending on where you live in Ontario, the company rep may actually be able to come in and help interrogate the device as well. Um, and so levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal gel pumps. So this is typically in Canada, um, the product is uh, Duodopa is the uh, intestinal gel um, created by Abvi. Typically these are for patients who have severe motor complications requiring tons of doses of levodopa through the day. Um, and they're too frail to undergo DBS. So they're quite complicated patients. Um, and typically uh, this allows them to have more of a continuous stream of medication rather than the kind of uh, peaks and troughs they would get with the um, gastric absorption or gastric um, PO levodopa. In Toronto, they have about 40 patients but there are eight centers in Ontario, including London, um, and Canada-wide are about 300 to 400 of these patients. One of the big uh, inhibitive, inhibitory factors is the fact that it is quite expensive at 100 to 200 dollars a day. So the pump works by bypassing the stomach. As I said, it, there is slow gastric emptying in Parkinson's disease. So you have two ports, one that's gastric for flushing, or you can use um, for medications in emergency situation, um, as well as the jejunal pump or jejunal tube that uh, is what the duodopa infuses through. Your CAD pump is what uh, does the infusion programming. And then the gray box below the CAD pump there is the duodopa cassette. So how do I troubleshoot the pump? I think there's something wrong with it. Um, the, the issues are going to mainly be around tubing, whether that's a compression issue, a dislocation or a disconnection. But at the end of the day, if you can't fix it, you're just going to give a patient levodopa. They will have more fluctuations than normal, but it will still be okay. They typically, the patients will have their own instructions on uh, taking their emergency oral levodopa. So this shouldn't be a surprise to them, but just uh, would be kind of the next step in this situation. So your compression and kinking is going to be a high pressure alarm on the CAD pump and essentially just means either the patient's in a weird position or the tube's kinked, et cetera. How to try to troubleshoot this would be to move or wiggle the tube. If it's resolved, then great. If it doesn't resolve, then you're gonna try flushing the inner tube with uh, saline or water or Coke or something. If that resolves, then great. If not, then you have to be more concerned. There's a beeswar formation. These patients are told to not eat vegetables with a lot of fiber to try to avoid beeswar formation. Sometimes it still occurs. In that case, you're not gonna fix it. You're just gonna have to stop the pump, start them on oral levodopa and then call GI for a tube change. Some gastroenterologists may not be familiar with uh, this setup, but the AbbVie reps will be available to help them kind of walk through the uh, situation. Dislocation essentially just results in a patient having fluctuating symptoms where um, the J-tube is actually just traveled backwards into the stomach. So the duodopa is just going into the stomach as opposed to where it needs to be absorbed in the jejunum. Really not a huge deal. They'll again, just need the supplementation until they can see their uh, specialist. And then disconnection. So the this in this situation, the J-tube actually comes loose from the entire system and gets lost into the intestines. Again, the gel will just be infusing through the G-tube into the stomach. So they will have that same fluctuation of symptoms. Um, and again, just supplementation with the levodopa until they're able to see a specialist. The only other thing to note about this is there is the spiral and on the um, J-tube here that uh, you may end up actually seeing coming out of the patient's bottom. If that is the case, you can 
remove that. It's not going to be connected to anything else. So that's not a concern. Um, and then just quickly, uh, so each cassette of the Duodopa contains the equivalent of about 20 cinemet tabs. And this would just be kind of your formulation for um, conversion if the patient did need to come into hospital as far as um, how you would kind of uh, start them on their appropriate daily equivalent levodopa dose. So again, just to kind of quickly go back to the cases, I appreciate I'm kind of running out of time here, but um, so the first case was just the paranoid gentleman who came in, who started to escalate his behavior, emerge uh, staff and security is called. So in this situation, I just uh, hope for you not to use Haldol in this patient um, and consider that the underlying cause of the um, psychosis is potentially related to his Parkinson's. Um, the second case being a 67 year old with the, the wait time of six hours, Parkinson's symptoms slightly worsening. And again, just um, considering your choice of antiemetics in this patient, um, whether this pain is actually more Parkinson's related pain rather than an acute pain and whether levodopa might be more appropriate uh, for trying to treat their symptoms in this case. The third case was just the DBS. So say in this patient, you felt that um, you were concerned more for a cardiac um, pathology and you wanted to get the ECG, again, just stopping the DBS to be able to actually get your accurate ECG. And then the last case was just um, trying to exemplify more of a Parkinsonism hyperparexia syndrome. So adding that to your list of um, hot and bothered patients, especially in the, uh, someone who has Parkinson's. So just to summary, uh, summarize, so Parkinson's is a super complex um, disease that involves a bunch of different neuro uh, simulators and different neural pathways, not just the ones we typically think about, uh, and can therefore result in a lot of dysautonomia, pain, and other uh, symptoms. So just to keep this in mind when you're evaluating your patient in the emergency department, whether that this is a, a new unrelated presentation or whether this is something that can be attributed to their underlying Parkinson's. Um, and most people don't need their levodopa to be precisely on time, but please do be aware of those with longstanding Parkinson's, those who do require their levodopa uh, five to seven times a day, they will be a lot higher risk for um, quickly developing uh, rigidity and uh, um, other more troubling symptoms that can potentially land them in the hospital for um, a couple of days for sure. And then lastly, just avoiding your antidopaminergic meds, your serotonergic meds, and just keeping um, Parkinsonism hyperpyrexia syndrome kind of on the back of your mind in those uh, hyperthermic agitated patients. DBS and duodopa pumps are becoming quite frequent, or more frequent anyway, in Parkinson's disease. Again, turn off the, the DBS for your ECG. If you're concerned you have battery issues, have a look at their remote. Um, if you're concerned that there's hardware malfunction or um, infection, your primary approach will just be to do imaging, but ultimately you're going to need to talk to your um, neurology team or DBS center. For your CAD pumps, if you have a high pressure alarm, try moving it, flushing the tube. If you don't have success, then just start them on levodopa, stop the pump and call GI. If they're having fluctuating symptoms, um, just it's probably more of a tube dislocation or disconnection, start them on the levodopa and uh, get them to follow up with the neurology or GI. And then lastly is just in any person with Parkinson's disease, just always consider if they're coming in with worsening of their symptoms, try to understand or cast a broad net to figure out what the underlying trigger of those worsening symptoms may be that it's not necessarily just related to a change in medication or a malfunction of their device. And with that, those are my references and happy to take any questions. Great presentation. I was just wondering about how, just reviewing again, differentiating the um, Parkinsonian hyperpyrexia syndrome from the dyskinetic hyperpyrexia syndrome, because the treatment is different. One you give levodopa, one you take it away. 
Yeah, so your um, Parkinsonism hyperpyrexia is going to be more your rigid, rigid akinetic patient, whereas your um, dyskinesia hyperpyrexia is going to be kind of your more um, excessive movements that's causing your hyperthermia rather than the uh, kind of rigidity. Alfonso Fasano here. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Great, great job. Uh, I want just to add that uh, sometimes CK helps. Uh, in the rigid version, CK are usually higher. Parkinson's patients tend to have a slightly higher CK anyways because of the un um, underlying rigidity. But in the um, akinetic, uh, rigid akinetic crisis, CK really go up. Uh, in the dyskinetic, also do, but not as much. So actually some of these people might have also kidney failure because of the excessive release of CK in the bloodstream in the rigid akinetic version. Right. Uh, Sydney, when you were talking about using propofol for these things, you're, that's in conjunction with airway management, intubation, all that sort of thing, not just giving propofol like a sedation yeah. type picture. Correct, yeah. It would be more your ICU trajectory, um, sedating, tubing, kind of to the point of just suppressing that movement. Right. Does uh, dantrolene have any role for these patients? Like with <laughs> MS? Um, so it, from what I was reading, it's one of those things that you um, and my understanding is that you can add it in if you're um, kind of stuck and not able to get control of things, but it wouldn't be um, kind of a first line thing. It's kind of more of the throwing the book at them type of thing rather than indicated. I suppose the other thing with that febrile patient as well is uh, covering them for sepsis as well, because we don't know whether sepsis might be the inciting event or the actual problem with them or or uh, or not so getting the fluids and antibiotics going early i would think would be important for sure and that's going to be the big thing with anyone in that uh situation with the um uh, hyperpyrexia syndromes is just covering for anything that could have triggered it. So it's not, you can't just assume that it's because they have a withdrawal of their medications. It could be an infection that tipped them over the edge or a trauma to that effect. So you do still have to treat them the same as you would for any of your um, undifferentiated uh, hyperthermic patients. Yes. Okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, then uh, I guess we'll end it there. Um, and thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was great. Thanks, Ed.